Kuta Zengpo La. I am Lynn Ma, and I have been actively involved in the Tasmanian Association for the Gifted for 19 years, including nine years as president. I am Tasmanian director and treasurer for the National Gifted Australia, Australian Association and a qualified and experienced teacher with experience teaching, training and facilitating learning with all ages. My knowledge of gifted education expanded as I advocated for my gifted son. I have conducted local information sessions for educators and parents, professional development for teachers and presentations at state, national and worldwide conferences. So, while I have no formal qualifications in gifted education, I have participated in many conferences and workshops, and I have read widely and done extensive research in particular areas of interest to me, including one topic, the development of leadership potential in gifted students, which was inspired by my teaching experiences in Bhutan. I have also published articles in the Australian, in sorry, in Australian gifted magazines and in the peer reviewed journal, the Australasian Journal of Gifted Education. And that was in 2014. So I look forward to sharing some of my learning with you today. Thank you very much for joining with, with me. So it's a happy coincidence that this presentation scheduled for the 29th of May falls within Australia's Gifted Awareness Week in 2021. Gifted Awareness Week was founded in 2015 by the Australian Association for the Education of the Gifted and Talented to raise awareness of the identification, support and learning needs of gifted children and to celebrate the dedication of individuals and educational bodies who are making a positive difference to the lives of gifted children and their families. I hope through my presentation today, I can help you to make a positive difference to the lives of a few more students in Bhutan and to help them thrive as gifted. I first presented a session like this back in 2015 when I was privileged to spend a year teaching in the far-flung village of Kinney in Tashi Yangtze. One of my friends and colleagues thanked me a little emotionally after the presentation because I had provided her with the knowledge that identified her son as more than just a naughty boy. So today I will cover understanding giftedness, understanding the nature of gifted and talent, giftedness and talent, what the terms mean and the levels and types of giftedness. And I will talk a little about the characteristics of gifted students the cognitive, social and emotional differences between gifted students and their classmates. Now, if I make any assumptions about your existing knowledge or I'm using language that you do not understand, please do forgive me. Um, please do feel free to send questions to me afterwards to ask me to clarify. Um, so thank you. And I do apologize also if I seem to be, to use an English idiom, teaching my grandmother how to suck eggs, I certainly don't intend to offend you by making any assumptions about what you may or may not already know. So, if we have a look at how we define giftedness, um, we generally say that gifted students have the capacity for advanced development relative to their age peers in at least one ability domain, intellectual, physical, creative, or social, to a degree that places them among the top 10% of their age peers. Now, this definition tells us that giftedness does not need to be across all areas. And giftedness refers to capacity not performance. So a child may be gifted in, in the language areas, but not in the maths and science areas. A child may be gifted at sport or music and not in classroom academics. At Ken Kinney, I taught a uh, grade seven student called Nima Wangchuk, 
he seemed to be gifted across all domains. And I thought he was an utterly delightful student. He was very clever in the classroom. He was good at sport and he was a good performer um, on the stage. He was a good dancer too, so. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Professor Francois Gagné's model of giftedness and talent. So Dr. Francois Gagné is an ac Canadian academic and researcher whose work on giftedness is respected and accepted worldwide. So in sharing a little about his model of giftedness and talent, I hope to help you understand a little better um, about giftedness. So Gagné's model of differentiating giftedness and talent explains how gifts over here on the left-hand side as innate abilities are developed into talent, what we see in an individual um, through a number of catalysts, various influences and processes that help that potential in an individual develop into talent, um, the realization of their potential abil abilities. So the over here, the various natural abilities, a child may be gifted intellectually, creatively, social, emotionally, or in a, a sensory way. But those natural abilities or gifts will not develop into talents. That is the way we see them. So a person with the potential to become a top athlete will not automatically become a top athlete unless certain things happen, unless they have opportunities, unless they undergo a really good training regime, unless they have an effective diet. So from that perspective, unless those catalysts all fall into place, then we are unlikely to see development of the potential into the skills over here. So when we look at the catalysts, we've got here a whole lot of intrapersonal factors. So for example, different students might have different levels of internal motivation. Some are more influenced and motivated by external factors, for example, getting good grades. One of my students tend to be highly motivated by his father's belt. Another's motivation always improved with the suggestion that his mother might come to know about his behavior. She'd threatened to withdraw him from school and make him work on the farm something that didn't really appeal to him. A highly able student might be living in the shadow of an even more highly able elder sibling and feel that he or she will never live up to um, what they perceive to be expected of them in terms of their sibling's performance. Environmental factors, another catalyst, might include the school environment and opportunities, and the home environment. And I will confess, I was arrogant enough at one point to allow myself the thought process that some of Bhutan's poorest families did not provide much stimulation for development of gifts into talents. But upon reflection, realized that your rich verbal traditions can provide an incredible catalyst for development of skills. One of my students who was weak at studies had an immense knowledge of local landmarks and their religious significance. And this information she shared with me on a pilgrimage to Omba. She did not need books at home to develop this ability into a demonstrated talent. There is at least one researcher in the field of giftedness who identifies spirituality as a type of giftedness. And maybe she had that type of giftedness. Systematically developed skills, for example, the development of social action skills, the ability to speak in public, 
effectively to take public office to uh, work in areas like the media may be developed through the developmental process that you provide within your schools of expecting students to speak at assembly through providing a democracy club and through providing opportunities such as leadership opportunities and responsibilities by being a captain. So let's think about how many children are gifted. The definition told us that we should think about the top 10% of age peers. So what does that mean in terms of numbers? If we consider a lower secondary school of around 800 students, that suggests that about 80 students across class PP to class eight are gifted. That's three students in every group of 30. If you are in a community-based school or a single classroom school with just 30 children, then perhaps one of them is gifted. So that gives us a bit of an indication of numbers. Now, let's look at how that looks on the bell curve. Some of you may not be familiar with this illustration of the spread of intelligence in the population. So the graph is intelligence, oops, sorry, intelligence quotient across this axis and the percentage of the population on the vertical axis. So those, what this tells us is that almost 70% of the population falls in what we term the average IQ range of between 85 and 115. Those on the left-hand side of the scale, those who have got an IQ of 80, 80 or below, are those who will be weak at studies. So those in the top 10%, those with an IQ of about 120 plus, um, 120 and up, are those we consider to be gifted. Some workers consider only those with an IQ of 130 and higher are gifted. So others term those with an IQ between 120 and 130 as mildly gifted. And it may be that those, the top, those in the top 10% are gifted only in one of the areas, um, language science and maths, the arts. And remember, the top here is as far away from the average in the class as the bottom here. Bhutan's curriculum and teacher's guides do make reference to catering for both those who are challenged with their studies and those who are potential potentially exceeding expectations. So you cater, you are starting to cater well for special needs students down at this end of the spectrum. Students at this end of the spectrum are also special needs students and they need catering for as well. So, Let's look at how this, what this giftedness means in terms of how you see a student's capabilities or apparent age. So the graph here, the green line here, shows students of average ability. So students of average ability, sorry, I do apologize, I'll go back. The blue line is showing students of average ability. So with an IQ of around about 100, 85 to 115, the student will more or less be demonstrating an ability that is what you would expect at that age. So the average six-year-old would be demonstrating an ability that you would expect of an average six-year-old. But if you take a child who has an IQ of about 130 when they enter school at age six, 
So a moderately gifted child has an IQ between 130 and 140. We are looking at the green or the orange line here. And you have a child who is operating at around what you would expect of an average eight-year-old. So conversely, if we think about a highly gifted child, so think about a highly gifted child at 10 years old, a highly gifted child with an IQ of 145 to 160 by the time they are 10 is presenting with the apparent potential abilities of a 15 year old. And just that's the uh, red line here. So think about what that means for the classroom. Now, interestingly enough, there is some suggestion that exceptionally gifted students, those that were right up the very top of the range here, slightly off the curve as it shows there, there is a suggestion that some of those students or that there are more of those students than there ought to be statistically, but um, that's something that we have not yet proven. So the top 2% of students, those with an IQ of 130 or above really need special attention. They may, may need acceleration. That means placing in a class or two above their current class that a placement that matches their mental age to learning opportunities that the school is providing. And it is worth noting that it is recommended that rigorous procedures should be put in place before using acceleration. And the Iowa acceleration scale is a good example of what is available to uh, assist with that. So, We'll look at some characteristics of gifted students, and I have tried to eliminate any information which might be different for a different culture, so as to keep it most relevant to you. So these next few slides were prepared for a mixed audience of parents and teachers, and I have left them in because many of you are parents of younger children. So, what can we expect of gifted children? They might walk and talk earlier than children of the same age. They might develop early and exceptional language patterns. So that means they might be using vocabulary that you generally wouldn't expect in a child of their age, or they might be using complex sentence structures much earlier than most children their age. And they may have a really exceptional memory for facts, people, or events. And that might show itself in them being able to recall an event that happened perhaps a couple of years previously or when they were really quite young. They have fabulous powers of observation and they might notice details that even the adults around them overlook. And they often relate well to older children or adults, often better than they relate to children their own age. And many show early reading ability, sometimes which is self-taught, but that of course depends on whether they've got access to books. And a lot of that happens before, before school entry. So what does that actually mean for the teacher? So many years ago, I had a, a phone call from a mother whose son was due to start kinder um, class PP or, or um, yeah, class PP the following year. Now she was worried because he was working with fractions, but he didn't quite have decimal numbers sorted out. So the psychologist who had looked at this child had suggested rather than start in kindergarten, he goes straight into the next class. Um, but she was very hesitant because he didn't have this perfection with this number manipulation, which certainly none of us would expect a child in either of those classes to have. Um, she did start him in school early, so in the higher class, and a year or two later, talking with her, she revealed that her son was not performing well at school. Now, it wasn't because he had been accelerated at school into that higher class to begin with, but it was because he was not being sufficiently enough challenged or sufficiently challenged in his classroom 
um, to engage his mind and to get him interested in working. But by first year high school, things had improved. And in first year high school, he was also enrolled in first year university maths. And he topped that course, first year university pure maths, which is quite a remarkable achievement for a boy who's in first year secondary school. Now, just because a child does not exhibit all of these characteristics certainly doesn't mean that they're not gifted. So if I can give you the example of my son, Jonathan, when he was in childcare or early learning, they wanted to uh, test Jonathan because they thought his language development was delayed. Um, it wasn't something I was concerned about, but I did allow them to test him. Um, the, the person testing him found nothing really out of the ordinary, identified that he had a really good understanding, which I knew. He just wasn't using the language very much at that point. But once he started talking, he didn't really stop. So more characteristics of gifted children. They develop skills easily and with few repetitions. So when it comes to the classroom, what that means is don't just give them more examples the same to do. They need different, not more. They have an excellent imagination. They may have imaginary friends. They make up, may make up fabulous stories. They have a great sophisticated sense of humor. They love jokes, like to play with words, and they might be passionate about different topics. And that passionate nature can translate or it can be seen to be sometimes very single-minded, very focused, perhaps even a little obsessive. They love to seek challenges, including intellectual challenges, and many prefer individual work. And that could be simply a matter of the way that they are offered groups to work in. Um, they don't necessarily learn good group work skills when they are in the situation where they must work with a heterogeneous group. The uh, researcher, Professor Karen Rogers, does say that gifted students should spend most of their day working with students of similar abilities. And students may be, gifted students may have a most amazing attention span and may not necessarily want to move on from one task to another when you want them to. And they can be very emotionally aware and intuitive. And again, if I can give you an example of my son, when he was two or three, I needed to go into hospital for something that I was a little bit concerned about. Jonathan gave me his favorite teddy bear to take into hospital with me. Um, he, was, he was aware that I was anxious and the teddy bear was going to look after me and keep me safe, which was lovely. So gifted students just want to learn lots of stuff, lots of material, lots of facts, lots of information. And sometimes the infant curriculum doesn't have a lot of that in it. So lovely cartoon here, um, illustrating that, their incredible thirst for knowledge. Now, this boy here, um, Nawang, I first met when he was starting class PP in 2015. He was a bubbly, inquisitive, delightful young boy. Unfortunately, within months of starting class PP, he became rather sad and withdrawn as his curious nature obviously did not sit well with his class teachers. I did raise my concerns and the matter was addressed. When I visited the school again in 2018, I was taken to visit classrooms and speak briefly with classes who would remember me. In his classroom, which was class three, when the students were asked if they had questions for me, the floodgates opened with a broad and intelligent range of questions from him. As we left, Vice Principal Sir informed me 
that the school often did not have answers for his questions. As I was leaving the school, Nawang stopped me and said I should come to his house as he had a gift for me and his mother would make me coffee. As I sat with the two of them, he plied me with more questions as his mother looked on with pride to listen to his conversation so fluent and intelligent with the visitor. So not all of our observations about gifted students are on the positive side. Sometimes they may have poor fine motor skills. They may have trouble holding a pencil or with using scissors. Many need less sleep than average children, and that can become frustrating for parents who would like a little bit of time out. Um, they may become frustrated when they're unable physically to do a task. And it's important that that frustration is dealt with and that gifted students learn how to fail. It's not that we want our students to fail, but we do need to teach them how not or how to deal with being not perfect first time round. Um, and they often prefer playing with older children or adults and have difficulty relating to children the same age. And that is because their play behavior is often more socially advanced, not less than their peers. For example, gifted students often like fairly set rules for games, whereas many young children, most young children, are happy to have very fluid rules with the games they play and make it up as they go along. Gifted students may also be much more sensitive and feel things much more deeply or intensely the others the same age. And an example of that was a comment I had from a very intelligent young man, I think at La Bessa Lower Secondary School, when I was there as a, um, a reading teacher for a month. And he commented on the impact of internationally funded development on Bhutan and what effect that might have on your, um, on your country culturally. So, Gifted students may also exhibit behaviours which result in their being confused with children with attention disorders or autism. They might have a tendency to daydream, doodle, just the do little drawings on the side, or drift off into their own world, mainly because it's more interesting there than it is in the classroom for them. And they may use their reasoning powers to argue with you. I encouraged my son to participate in debating in upper primary and early secondary school, an activity that he con continued all through secondary school. And he practiced extensively his debating techniques at home. Gifted students may also get bored easily, resist work, disturb others, or correct others, sometimes impolitely, including correcting the teacher. Now, Nima Wangchuk, I have already mentioned, nice cheeky grin there. This young man was highly gifted across the spectrum, academic, sports, and arts. He did not disturb others or resist work, but he did tell me when I asked him that he was often bored in my maths class, and I gave him permission to work ahead in the textbook while I was demonstrating to the class or work on an alternative set of mathematical tasks that I had given him. He did correct teachers, including me. And while I always found his suggestions offered politely, a teacher fresh from college was more threatened by his questioning and correcting. Um, an example of his wanting to point something out to me was when I was demonstra demonstrating to the class a range of techniques for solving equations um, as required by the grade seven curriculum. And Nima quietly came up to me and said, Madam, it is much easier this way. Um, and he was perfectly right as far as I was concerned that he was um, solving uh, simultaneous equations the way that I would have preferred to teach their solution. 
um, in, to my mind, it was the neatest, the most obvious, but the curriculum did require a range of approaches um, to allow students to choose what worked best for them. But Nima was most respectful in the way that he wanted to put me on the straight and narrow about that. Gifted students may also lack, res lack respect for adult arguments. And maybe that lack of respect is justified if the learning material is te tedious or the teacher has misinformation. So in terms of tedious learning material, there was a study done on maths textbooks a while back. So, and in the class eight textbook, it found that 30% of pages in the average class eight maths textbook had some new content. That's only 30% of pages had some new content, not 30% of the whole book. So you can imagine how tedious a gifted child who learns really quickly would find that level of repetition. Now, gifted students may also be non-conforming, and we ought to think about the implications of that when we're raising children. So in their younger years, we teach children that we would like them to do as others do. Why don't you sit quietly like Sange? Why don't you help your father like Tenzin? But when they become teenagers and they want to exercise independence, freedoms, where they want to exhibit individualities of style, well, as their peers do, what sort of message do we give them then? We want them to be individuals and not be like their peers. Um, also, another lovely example I had I came across of, of not conforming amongst uh, some of the more intelligent children was one young lady who was a very capable writer and she wrote a lovely poem saying say no to love which unlike her peers who many of whom were focused on boyfriends and girlfriends at that time um, definitely showed a little bit of non-conformity and individual individuality Many gifted students dislike group work, um, which I've already mentioned, and do monopolise discussion if they're forced to work in a group. And that dislike of a mixed ability group work can carry through even to relatively high levels of education. So my son, Jonathan, when he was in year 12 and early in university study, he might say to me, I have to work with this person, but it's okay, he'll let me do all the work. So gifted students don't like the way that the standard of um, work output might be compromised by having others of lesser ability work on it. There's a degree of perfectionism and they want the best, some may want the best assessment they can have. They don't want to lose marks because the standard is lower because of the input of some people. Gifted students may also be reluctant to complete written work. And that comes perhaps from a thought process that says, well, I know this. Why do I have to prove it? Let's move on and let me learn something new. They may appear inattentive, but then cope easily with the work. And I had a conversation with a parent one evening who was most indignant about what she thought was very unboy-like behaviour in her son, who was able to both talk and listen at the same time. And he would talk through, um, chat with his friends while the teacher was teaching in class, but then know what the teacher was teaching about. Gifted students might be overly sensitive to criticism. They might show constant perfectionism as well. So perfectionism can be a good thing, but it can become excessive and dysfunctional if it results in a student thinking that they can never be good enough or they don't know where to start or they won't start because they're not, they don't know exactly what they're going to do for the whole time or they don't think they can do it as well as they would like to do it. So this young lady, Tashi, 
her perfectionism drove her to work hard, but it did leave her with a lot of self-doubts. And she maintained that she was lazy and didn't study hard enough. She studied hard enough to top her science stream in year 12 and earn a full scholarship to study for an MBBS. And my commendations to your education system, which can support a student from a remote village, in this case, Manam and Tashi Yangtze, to achieve so well and continued tertiary education. Well done, all of you. Gifted students may also use their sense of humour appropriately. So joking at the wrong time or um, coming up with inappropriate jokes for the people they are with. And they might behave very differently at school to the way they behave at home. Now, this is something that we often see uh, in our society that a student might be compliant at school, but then when they get home, just getting very angry, frustrated and misbehaving. They might be reading well at school, or sorry, they might be reading well at home, but then not reading at school. Uh, because the rest of their classmates are not yet reading at school. They might sometimes dumb down to fit in. So behave as if they are less intelligent than they are. So they don't stand out from their classmates. And that can be both amongst boys and girls. And it can start as low as kinder and go through to late adolescence. And even further. So Sometimes it's good to be able to separate those who work hard to get good marks, the high achievers, and the gifted learners, those with true potential. So I'll give you a few moments to look at that list and I'll talk a little about it. So this one here, being selectively mentally engaged. So for, from some students, that could mean they look as if they're wasting time and not paying attention, but they know the answers. They can prove they've been listening. Um, it's just what they were listening to wasn't really sufficiently interesting. Or it could mean that they really focus on something if it is something they like and don't bother if it's something that they don't like. Now, for a gifted child to actually demonstrate these characteristics, they do need an emotionally and socially safe and supportive environment. If a child is in an, an environment where they're for example, ability to generate complex and abstract ideas is not appreciated, then they're not going to flourish. So not all gifted learners will actually demonstrate these characteristics. And the many reasons for that really would require another full session. Some gifted learners, particularly those who lean towards pleasing their teachers, and the young lady I, I was talking about before, and whose picture I showed you, Tashi, was one of those. They might seem to demonstrate more of these characteristics, the characteristics of a high achiever, than those of gifted learners. So some more differences between high achievers and gifted learners. This one here, gifted learners needing fewer repetitions to master. So that's especially important in subjects like maths where multiple repetitions are normally built into lessons, especially within the textbooks. Although I did think that the class seven and eight maths textbooks perhaps didn't have enough repetitions for average learners. This one here, gifted learner, a gifted learner infers and connects concepts. So an example of that, when I asked one of my grade uh, class seven classes, 
if certain shapes were reflections of an original. Nemo, who I talked about earlier, identified that one was both a reflection and a translation. And in my other class seven maths class, this young man, Norbu, um, adapted and applied a geometrical method to a different type of problem. So inferring and connecting concepts. And a few more differences between high achievers and gifted learners. The intensity of gifted learners can sometimes be annoying if they want to know, want to know all the time. This point, a gifted learner sometimes manipulates information and that can include manipulating the truth to suit them. Anticipating can include finishing your sentences for you. Answering a question before the rest of the class has heard you finish it. What as teachers we might call butting in. Gifted students can be highly, oops, sorry, highly self-critical. That can mean just never being happy with their own work, never finishing work, maybe not even starting it because they know they cannot get it perfect. So even if they're getting A's, they might not be satisfied with that. They might think they can do better. And many students may not be motivated by grades. They prefer to be engaged, excited um, by their learning rather than focus on getting the results you would like them to show. Now, why do we cater for gifted students? The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child does tell us that we should. The education of the child shall be directed to the development of the child's personality, talents, mental and physical abilities to their full potential. They need nurturing to develop to their full potential. And your constitution refers to the full development of human personality. And that can only occur if a person's potential is maximized. So how we actually do that for gifted students would be the subject of many more sessions such as this. But good differentiated learning, which I know you have done professional learning about, does help. So how are gifted students different to average students? These lists over the next few slides are aimed more at teachers and school administration. And there is some overlap with previous slides, but I thought it would be useful to present these grouped together under these headings. So the brains of gifted students operate in different ways. They move and act differently. They feel things differently. They think differently. They imagine differently and they experience emotions differently, usually much more intensely. The problem with this is that it's not obvious, like a physical disability or physical difference is obvious. It's often relatively invisible. Um, and by secondary school, the student might be managing it so well that they blend in and we don't necessarily identify those students and understand their needs. So we have touched on some of these cognitive um, differences. So I will give you a few moments to review them. Now, some of the behaviours that we might see because of those, and I've already mentioned the reluctance to move on to another task because they are very intense 
about what they are working on at the time, or very quickly moving on from what you require them to do, because they can think of lots of other possibilities, uh, lots of different directions that the idea might take them in, um, lots of relationships to other things that they know. I've already mentioned they might have difficulty starting, especially if they're required to write something, as they find it difficult to limit their ideas by committing them to paper. And they might come up with radical or surprising ideas and solutions to problems, if that is something that is permitted in the classroom. They might get bored because they understand the concept being presented and don't need any further explanation. And as I've already mentioned, they might not demonstrate their learning in a way that you would like to see in achievements, in tests and exams. Again, the intellectual differences, much of it we touched on in the general information. So students thinking all the time might result in them thinking and asking questions, but what if? And responding with, yes, but, or adding, well, I was thinking. Um, they're looking for more. And perhaps asking the teacher, well, could I do this instead? I've already mentioned they might be happier working alone than with a group who don't have the same passion and understanding. Sometimes they might be work happy working with students who do have the same level of passion, of understanding, of ability, but they may not often get the chance to do so. To be given the chance to do that might mean they have to work with uh, gifted students from another class um, or work with students from a higher, uh, higher class or older age group or even adults who have a passion for the topic. This, um, the theoretical thinking that sometimes uh, gifted students come up with. So Nawan at age six asked his father, if Miss Lynn adopts me, does that mean I would go back to Australia with her? Now, we both wondered where on earth that question came from, because at that time, the school talked about adoption, but the concept was mentoring of students who were poor at studies, not the concept of legal adoption of a child. So um, for him, that was a really advanced theoretical question at age six. Now, these psychomotor differences, uh, really rapid speech, almost as if you need to find a switch somewhere and turn it down. Um, impulsive behaviours, being competitive, talking nonstop, organising things nonstop, nervous habits, repeated behaviours, wanting fast action and sports, physical expression of emotions, I'm happy, therefore I have to jump up and down. I'm angry, therefore I have to beat the desk. And I came across a young student um, when I was a BCF reading teacher at the Bessa, um, a young student in class one. And in the one month visit I had at the school, I only had four lessons with that class, mostly without a regular teacher present, which presented me with some challenges as they didn't have a lot of English and at that point in their education and I don't have a lot of Zonka. So without Jimmy's teacher present, Jimmy's behavior was an absolute teacher's nightmare. I saw him exhibit just about all of these psychomotor differences um, certainly can't speak about sleeplessness, but it, um, it was enough for any teacher to tear their hair out. Gifted students often have different experiences of the senses. They can, all of their senses can have a heightened awareness. So for example, tactile sensitivity, they might, particularly feel a rough fabric against their skin 
or not like the feel of certain uh, substances. It manifests with some children not liking to eat with their hands, for example, or not, not liking to eat certain foods with their hands. They might be particularly sensitive to smells or tastes, um, textures, as I've mentioned, um, and sounds. And that can actually provide some sort of sens sensory overload for them because they are experiencing these things much more intensely. So when I was at Kinney, um, I noticed a small class PP or class one boy in the multi-purpose hall. And when the sounds got particularly loud, he would just put his hands over his ears to block them, obviously experiencing the sensory overload. And they can have a very, very different imagination. They can visualize things very vividly. And as well as imagining fabulous stories, that can also cause them some concern by imagining the worst in any situation, catastrophizing, uh, making a catastrophe out of something that is not really a major thing. Um, because they can think about all the possible po possibilities. Um, children with that particular degree of vivid visualisation would be appalled at reading news articles, such as one I saw yesterday, that the Greenland ice sheets are melting more rapidly than previously and will cause severe ocean rises. Now, reading into the article, we are looking well past the lifetime of uh, me, you, and any of our students before that happens um, to a degree of concern, but it is happening. Um, so sometimes this different imagination um, can be strong enough to stop them getting involved in new situations because they are visualizing, well, what if this happens? Um, and that, that can make things very, very difficult for them. One thing, if the complexity of their, the ideas in their imagination um, is not matched by their ability to get those ideas across to people, they might need some scaffolding, they might need some assistance, some skill building to enable them to demonstrate what they think or what they can do. And that applies to a lot of areas. So art, music, writing, etc. cetera. Um, now, the students who can visualize so differently, um, we often term visual thinkers, and that, again, is another huge topic in the area of gifted education. There are emotional differences between uh, gifted students and their same age average peers. And extreme emotional sensitivity is sometimes mistaken as having psychological problems. Um, so, for example, possibly going from calm to absolutely crazily hysterical in just a moment, sometimes over a stimulus that we might think is very minor. Sometimes that is interpreted as the child uh, may seem immature and is emotionally immature. They may feel anxious um, because they're feeling different. They may feel an incredible sense of guilt and sense of responsibility at problems that they see in the world, um, at hunger, at COVID, at the number of deaths in India from COVID at the moment. They might feel inadequate and inferior, um, perhaps about their ability to deal with some of these things that they are seeing. And often they may feel lonely. Um, they need a peer group who accepts them understands them, values them, and challenges them. And it can be very lonely to be very different. They may show concern and empathy for others, have a heightened sense of justice, 
of right and wrong. And they may have a strong memory for feelings, which I did this once before and I felt this way and that was not nice. Therefore, I don't want to do it again. Or I did this before and it felt fantastic and therefore I do want to do it again. Um, sometimes problems adjusting to change, sometimes depression. They need security. And sometimes they get very physical responses to these emotional situations. So a child who is feeling anxiety may develop stomach aches or worse. So some of the social differences, some gifted students are timid and shy, not all of them, of course, and they might need some help in finding uh, suitable friends and building social relationships. Now, true friends are very hard to find. And that's interesting because that can be a result of the intellectual mismatch with age peers making friendships different. So for the, your average seven-year-old, um, happy to be friends with most many other seven-year-olds, that's fine. But your gifted seven-year-old may be functioning more like a 10-year-old and they might not find that they have things in common uh, with the, the, the average seven-year-olds with their class peers. The, the other aspect of difficulty with friendships is that expectations of friendship can often be a lot more sophisticated in gifted children and in gifted adults. They might expect a friend to be a friend for life rather than just somebody to play with in the playground at the moment. They might be looking for some very meaningful interaction rather than just somebody to chase around with on the playground. And they might be considering that a friend should be everything rather than having, if you like, friends for a reason and friends for a season. So by that, what I mean is friends for a reason. You can have friends with whom you play sport. You have friends with whom you discuss books. You may have um, friends with whom you will go for a walk. Um, and many of us have someone special in our lives who are other sorts of friends. So, you know, friends for a reason, different friends in different contexts and friends for a season. Gifted children might, as I mentioned before, be expecting a friend to be a friend for life rather than accepting that it's okay, that friendships do come and go and we move on from some friends. The long memory for negative experiences impacting on future attempts at social interaction. So it might actually... Uh, result in the student being or the child being anxious, um, linking with perfectionism, not being prepared to risk failing at making a friend. And gifted children might be socially on the outskirts of the group and have a low concept as a result of that. So there is research in Western countries that shows that certain um, that academically talented students are often less accepted by their peers than those who are more average. Uh, though if the academic talent is accompanied by a sporting talent, then the student is more socially accepted by their peers. And that lack of social acceptance, being socially on the outskirts, can lead to negative emotional well-being. Um, which can also arise from those who feel they're different and cannot find a true friend. And that negative emotional well-being can link back to some of those things on the previous slide, um, anxiety, depression, um, even more. And 
This one's an interesting one. Conscious social integration with age peers may lead to suppression of intellectual and emotional needs. So a conscious attempt to actually be part of the group. If it means suppressing part of who you are can actually lead to some problems, some mental health problems. And that's best illustrated by a statement I heard a daughter of a friend make a decade or so ago when she said, I don't feel I can be myself. And sometimes with gifted students, they're not even very clear about what self is. They're not really sure who they are. So, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions via my email, which is there. Uh, I do use Facebook and Facebook Messenger, and I occasionally use LinkedIn. If you do want to connect with me via Facebook, please send me a message to tell me this is how you know me, because I just don't accept friend requests from people who I think are strangers. But I'm very happy to answer any questions you have arising from this. And my best wishes to you in helping to identify your gifted students and moving towards seeing that they thrive as gifted. Thank you very much. And uh, goodbye. <laughs>